Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Holly Randall Unfiltered. Thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you to my amazing guest, uh, Stormy Daniels, for also joining us today. Hi. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's good to see you. So, uh, you haven't been doing much lately, huh? Yeah, just yeah, kind of sitting around. Yeah, and... it's been uh, it's been quiet. I've been wondering what you've been up to. I'm like, yeah, you know, I haven't much. heard I haven't heard Stormy's name lately. You probably forgot about. Yeah, me. I kind of did. I was like, what happened? That girl she just faded into oblivion. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So how are you? Frazzled. I bet. <laughs> I bet it's been um, a bit of a hurricane these last few weeks, hasn't it? Yes. Yes. But you know, got to make lemonade out of lemons, I guess. Yeah. You know, um, so I know that I can't ask you anything specific, so we're just going to get that out of the way because I know that people were like hoping that I was going to get some great expose, and I was like, no, that's not going to (laughs) happen. I can guarantee you that. Um, But how are you just handling, like, for me, I'm kind of more interested in the media fallout around everything because I think it's really kind of reflected the way that mainstream society sees the adult industry, and unfortunately, you probably become the brunt of a lot of that. Yes. um, There's been two interesting things. Mm. Um, They won't say my name without putting the word porn star in front of it, which normally doesn't bother me because I'm not one of those people that are like, oh, no, you have to call me an adult entertainment artist. Right. You know, like, or (laughs) it doesn't bother me except that it's so prevalent and I have a kid. Yeah. And I'm just waiting for her to go, what's a porn star? Yeah. You know what I mean? So that's, you know, they just, because if I was a waitress, it wouldn't be waitress Stormy Daniels or, <laughs> or bank teller Stormy Daniels. Right, right. You know, um, so that's been, you know, they like to sensationalize and, yeah. and use that. Yes. Um, also, and I don't know if this is just the media in general or if it's just in relation to me and what's going on. Is there not a thing as fact checking anymore? No, like they will. That's li- why there's so much fake news out there. Ha! Exactly. <laughs> um, but like they will literally say like blatant lies, and some of it I get because they're trying to like make me look bad or paint the stereotypical mm-hmm. image, and some of it doesn't even make sense. Like the first dance booking I did, uh, which was a club that I'd been to before, uh, back in January, there I absolutely did not give any interviews. Mm-hmm. Did not happen. You know, I was slammed anyway, but a journalist wrote a whole article about an interview, and I'm using air quotes, interview that I did. And if you're going to make up a story, at least make it good. But it was like the details in it were so, like, why would you lie about that? It was like, she pointed to the DVD with her, like, pink sparkly nail polish and said, my nails weren't even painted pink. <laughs> like, it was like, why would you lie about that? That's so random. And it was like talking about two of my DVDs that I obviously wrote, directed, and produced. So right. I, I know that I never said these words. And it right. said like, oh, she talked about how um, the, her newest movie, Unbridled, is the sequel to Want It. Mm, no. Want It was set in the 1700s and Unbridled was set this year. Yeah. Like, it's not a, like, it's just like, why would you even lie about that? Right. Like, and then there, it went on to talk about other things that I won't repeat. But it was just like, why? Was it, it a reputable news yes, source at all? Yes. It was? And then, yeah. And then the LA Times this weekend made up blatant lies about me. I did a dance booking um, at the Deja Vu in Hollywood. Uh, that morning, I text the manager like I've done with every dance booking that I've ever done. Mm-hmm. You know, you text the day before or the morning of, you're supposed to be there. Hey, just checking in. Uh, what time would you like me to be there? Do, is there anything I need to know? Usually ask if it's topless or nude if I don't know. Mm-hmm. If there's any rules, do you have my intro? Does the DJ prefer a drive or CD? Like all these things that, right. that you want to be prepared for your show. Right. He said, oh, that's great. We look forward to having you. Please be here at 9 o'clock. We plan to put you on stage between 9.30 and 10. Cool. I pulled in at exactly nine Mm o'clock, was on stage at 10 o'clock, had a great show, made the most in tips that I've ever made in LA. Mm -hmm. Um, Everything went perfect. They were, they treated me great. I tipped out when I left. I got paid. There was absolutely no issues whatsoever. Read in the LA Times, which is a reputable paper the next morning, that the club, uh, Employees were, and I quote air quotes again, uh, disgruntled that I was unprofessional. I was late that I made the customers wait. And they even had a quote from an, a manager named Eddie. And being LA Times, they put it on Twitter and it was picked up by all these other news agencies. And it really, honestly, it really hurt my feelings. Yeah. Because I thought I did a great job. They told me to my face I did a great job. There was people there. I made money. Yeah. So I'm not really understanding what could have happened. Right. And like I said, if somebody says, like, 
they think I'm ugly or they don't like my show or they don't like my costume. That's an opinion and being in the adult industry for as long as I have, I have a thick skin that rolls off. But right. to blatantly lie and say that I was late is not true. Yeah. And so I text the manager and sent him a screenshot and was like, explain this to me because I did what you asked me to do and blah, blah, blah. And he was like, this absolutely didn't happen. I've asked all my staff. No one said this. You were right on time. Your show was the best we've had. It was the busiest we've had for our first show in the evening. You were the most, prof- and I can show you the text message. You were the most professional feature entertainer we've ever had and we're really embarrassed and we apologize. That's but, insane. But this has happened every weekend that wow. I've been dancing. And they'll just randomly make up stuff. And sometimes it's actually very entertaining and funny. Yeah. Like, uh, I carry, I, every time I get to a new city, I run to Walmart. Mm-hmm. And I get the things that I need for my show mm-hmm. that I don't put in my suitcase. Candles, because they'll break. Mm-hmm. Um, lotion, because it'll leak. Mm-hmm. A blanket, because I ruin it. And I always get a laundry basket, a mm-hmm. white laundry basket, because they're $3.95 at Walmart. <laughs> and I throw them away at the end of the booking. I use a laundry basket, because I can see it in the dark, because it's white. Yeah. And it's not going to get ruined if it gets wet or whatever. Yeah. And so I had, and then it sounds like a science. It's, I do have it down to yeah. a science. I am very meticulous about yeah. this. I take it very serious. And so <laughs> I use the basket on stage to throw my costume into mm-hmm. it and to pick the money up and whatever. And then afterwards, I dump it out and I use it to bring out my DVDs and merch to do mm-hmm. autographs. Well, the laundry basket's in the background of the shots of me mm-hmm. signing. Mm-hmm. And the headline on TMZ that week was Stormy Daniels is so broke, she has to do her laundry at the strip club. Oh my God. <laughs> And I laughed because that was all, all the total horse. Can I cuss? Yeah, you can totally okay. cuss. Because the total horse shit still very funny. It oh doesn't, my God. doesn't really make me look unprofessional. It's just entertaining and yeah. like stupid but funny. <laughs> but like this other stuff about me being late or that I just, yeah. it makes me look bad. And my agent called me today in a, in a total meltdown that some of the other clubs were like questioning booking me yeah. because they thought that you were unprofessional. That I was thought, unprofessional. oh, this whole thing's gotten to her head and now she's a diva no. and all that kind of yeah. stuff. And like a club in, um, on paper in New York when I was there said that I was such a bitch, I didn't even come out and take pictures with the fans. But it's funny because the very next article was a video of me taking pictures with the fans where, well, if nobody took a picture with me and nobody was interested, how did, after that one show, did I sign for two hours and do like $1,500 in photos? That's insane. So like it, they, they have free reign to just make up whatever they want. Yeah. It's really frustrating. It's got to be. And because, uh, because I think that, first of all, the paparazzi, like they're not great with boundaries anyway. Yeah, you think? <laughs> but because I'm in the adult business, there's less boundaries. Mm. Like, you know, just dealing yes. with fans. Like, yeah, they yeah. think because but they've seen us naked that they can cross the line a little bit further. Mm-hmm. And that comes with the job. Right. But like, they've been knocking on my door in my house and I haven't been there. I've been on the road or whatever. But I get it. Like, it's your job to come and try to find me, it's your job to try to get the scoop, whatever. I get it. I'm not mad about it. It's annoying, but I'm not mad. Mm-hmm. What I am mad about is when you walk across the street and tell all of my neighbors who I am, and now my kid it, can't play with some of her friends. Oh, That's man. uncalled for. That's really tough. Because you know you go over and knock, oh, what do you think about living across the street from Stormy Daniels? And of course the lady's like, who, what? Oh, you didn't know? Across the street from you is adult porn star, you know, blah, 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 blah. So obviously now it's like, <sighs> Or her kids are outside, they see us, she's like, inside, you know? Yeah. Like, uncalled for. Yeah, that's brutal. Yeah. I remember being a kid and having to make up stories about what my parents did for a living because we just didn't want people to know and to make erroneous judgments about right. our family and kind of see us in a disparaging light. And I had a better childhood than most people, so. Exactly. You know, like, yeah. that has nothing to do with... Um, who you are as a parent, you know, what you do for a living. And that's just no, it's been so frustrating that people have been that way. Yeah. they. I mean, she's seven. Yeah. But I mean, she's handling it really well. And she, I don't lie to her. Mm-hmm. Like she knows that I come to LA and I write and direct movies and I make movies. And she knows that they're, she doesn't know what sex is. Mm-hmm. Therefore, she doesn't know what porn is. Right. But she understands it's for grown-ups only. She understands that there's movies that come on TV mm-hmm. that are inappropriate for kids. Mm-hmm. She knows that there's things called horror movies or mm-hmm. you know action movies that show violence. And there are things that you're not allowed to watch when you're they're for grown-ups only. Yeah. And she knows that I do movies that aren't for kids. Yeah, that's I mean that's pretty much how because people always ask me like how did you, when did you find out how did you know and I don't remember there ever being like this epiphany moment where like you know my parents lied to me the whole time and then right. suddenly came clean which I think personally is much healthier because 
It wasn't a shock, and right. I wasn't raised with the sense that what my parents did was shameful. Exactly. It was, just, and what they told me was basically like it's for grownups only. Yeah. And I and was I like, can, okay, whatever. I can tell you without a doubt, the day she finds out what sex is, the very next sentence that I say is, "Oh, do you know those movies that mommy and you know yeah. makes or is involved in?" Whatever I'm at at that point in time. Mm-hmm. Well, those have sex in them, and I guarantee instead of freaking out, she'd be like, "Oh, yeah, okay." Like she won't it, care because the thing is, your kid, like obviously, normalcy is relative. So, you know, what is normal to them is what they were raised around. Right. And if you don't make it, it's like when kids fall down and they hurt, and they hurt themselves, and they look to see like if yes. you cry, and I'm like, get up. Yeah, exactly. If they're like, well, you know, because they take cues from their parents. So right. if you don't treat it, it's like it's some big shameful no. deal. Then she won't feel that same way. Yeah. She won't have that same um, kind of bias against it, yeah. which I think is a much healthier way to raise she falls, children. You know, she falls off her pony. I'm like, oh, is anything broken? Get back on. Yes, you know what I mean. Always like got to get back on the horse. Got to get back on. So I mean, that's not, I'm way more terrified. This is so funny. Like I'm so scared about when she finds out that I've been lying about Santa Claus. <laughs> Like I'm not kidding. That's gonna be like I think that's gonna crush her. She's gonna look at. I mean, she, I'm really. It could go either two ways because she's very smart. She's either mm-hmm. gonna look at me and be like, I know, I was just seeing how long I can milk it for. Yeah, which is what I'm ho- hoping that she's. I'm uh, hoping with all my heart she's playing me. Right yeah, now. yeah, yeah. But I think she believes, and I think she's gonna be like, you lied to me. <laughs> like I think I'm way more terrified about that than about her finding out that I make movies for grownups. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> I wonder how like. Parents, because I don't remember how I found that out either. I think I just, it probably you get to an age where like your friend finds out and then your friend tells me like Santa Claus isn't real. And they're like, no, they're like, yeah, he's not real. And then you kind of grow to believe that. But I don't remember that moment either about finding out about Santa Claus. Yeah, I I think it's going to be, it's not going to be a good day. Yeah. I'm way more concerned about that. (laughs) So, okay, so you started off as a dancer, and that was the other thing that you were expressing frustration about when we, yes. before we started the podcast, was that people were like, oh, she's got to go back to dancing now. Or she has to start dancing she has to, now. Yeah, That's and it's like, you've thing. always been a dancer, I you've know. always done feature dancing. I mean, you started off as a dancer, right. you were a dancer when I'm when we first met you. Right, it's like, I keep reading these stories, they're like, oh, it's so sad that she must have spent all her money, and now she's resorted to traveling in this you know, to do these strip club tours. I'm like, um, that hasn't changed at all in the last 15 years. Yeah. Like I've always been a feature dancer. The clubs that I'm going to, over half of them I've been to before. Yeah. Some of them were booked before all of this stuff happened. Right. They've, they've changed their marketing. Right, right, right. Because they would be stupid not to. Right. Not saying I approve or whatever. I can't, yeah. I have no control over that. Right. And I can even say like that whole make America horny thing, that's not me. A club owner in uh, South Carolina came up with it, and all the others jumped on it. Of I have course. no control over how a club like advertises me. Right. You haven't seen me type those words anywhere ever because it's like, <laughs> oh god, this is so cheesy. Yeah. But I don't have control over it. Right. And um, so it's like really frustrating that people think that I'm doing this because I have to, and it's because I'm sad and I spend all my money. But that's not true. I'm doing my job that I've always done. Right. The same thing with movies. Yeah. And then you also said that you felt that um, you were getting a lot of ageism too. Yeah, which is crazy to me. Like, yeah. this isn't something that I was prepared for. Like, I've been called every name you can imagine. Mm-hmm. I am the devil. I'm a whore. I'm a slut. I'm a skank. I'm disgusting. I'm diseased, which is another huge misconception, obviously, because we're yeah. safer than the general public because we're right. testing. But, um, you know, I have no soul and I'm the devil. Maybe I am. But, <laughs> but, You're like, you that know, last part, maybe. Or like, you know, I'm too fat or I'm too skinny or my boobs are, you know, stupid, whatever. Like that's, I've been called all of that and I was kind of prepared for that. But what I wasn't expecting was to how many people are latching on, oh, you're too old to do porn. Like I've never really heard that before. And I didn't realize that there was an age limit on when you could be sexy. I understand you're too ugly to do porn or you're too <laughs> like whatever. Yeah. But no one's saying that. Yeah. No one's saying like you're too fat or your body like they're all saying you're too old. And Which was, is so okay, first of all, it's so <laughs> wrong because I'll tell you right now, and I'm sure you're aware of the way that like, you know, the the faux incest stuff has taken off. Yeah. And like the MILF stuff has taken off. That's like a big thing. So now actually, you know, older women are more in demand in the adult industry than they've ever been. Yeah. Like I am constantly looking for new MILFs. Like mm-hmm. I need 
more older women. I mean, we're at a point now where we're booking 26-year-old girls to play MILFs because we don't have anybody older. Right. I mean, it's ridiculous. So that's totally inaccurate in just that sense alone. Um, and then also, too, porn has always been great in the way that it's embraced all different kinds of people. Right. Of all different shapes and sizes, different um, fetishes, different ages. Yeah. And it's been really inclusive in a way that mainstream media isn't in. And that's the one thing I've kind of always been proud about when it comes right. to porn. So for them to, to say yeah. that just shows that they don't understand the adult industry at all. And it's coming mostly from women. Which yeah, makes me it's always that way. Which makes it? me ask two questions. Mm. One, I thought we weren't supposed to reach our sexual peak to forty. Right. So you're saying when I reach my peak, I shouldn't be enjoying it. Yeah. Like I shouldn't be shooting because it seems like the, that would be the best time to shoot. Right. It would be the best to film. Yeah. Because I'm having a great time. Yeah. In theory, I mean. And here's my other question: If you're a woman and or say you know your husband's fifty, mm-hmm. would you rather walk in on him? Watching and masturbating to a 19 year old girl or to a 40 year old girl. Mm. Because to me, that's weird if he's masturbating to someone your daughter's age. Yeah. I mean, in my experience, men tend to like what's closer to them. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No. As I've gotten older, so has my fans, you know? Right. And I mean, I love work. It's funny. I, I love working with MILFs. I actually say that if I could just do a MILF movie all the time, it would be great because they show up. They show up on time. They read their script. Mm-hmm. They like brought the wardrobe that they were asked to bring. Um, they actually like can act. They mm-hmm. are sexual because they've grown into right. their sexuality. They're experienced. Yeah, and they're more comfortable with themselves. <laughs> and they uh, know all the same bands that I used to listen to. There you go. <laughs> they know who Depeche Mode is. These exactly. days I get these girls. I shot a girl um, the other day whose mom was the same age as me. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and that's happening more and more often now. Yeah, and it's just like so depressing to me. But I don't know. That was that was a real shock for me. Yeah, and I can't understand. Don't you? I mean, I don't know. For me, like, I am so glad I'm not twenty anymore. I wouldn't go back and do my twenties again for anything. I wish my butt was still twenty. <laughs> well, sure. I mean, but, yeah, but, yeah. I, I, but I like physically. The, yeah. Yes. <laughs> But I mean, just um, mentally, I mean, you change so much in your 30s, yeah. you know, and, and you're so insecure about yourself when you're 20. And yeah. um, you don't like, I don't know, I feel like you don't you don't recognize your own value until you get older. And you don't appreciate things. Yes, you definitely That's, don't. Yeah. My mom would always say to me, she's like, you won't appreciate your looks, darling, until they're gone. And I'm like, fuck, you're so right. She was right. She was always right. Damn it. She was always right. <laughs> so... We okay, so I we first met you like at the very beginning of your oh, yeah. career. How early was it? Had you shot before? I don't remember. Let's see. Um, I had not done boy girl yet. Okay, when you shot me, and so it was in two thousand two. Okay, two thousand two, and I even remember how the conversation came up because I was you know I was brand new, and I had done a couple girl girl scenes, but. I mean, we both know there's not as much girl girl work as boy girl mm-hmm. work, and I was in you know talks of maybe getting a contract, and if that was the case, they wanted to be the first person to shoot boy girl of me, which makes sense. Mm-hmm. Um, so I really was just looking to supplement income, and Brad was like Brad Armstrong from Wicket mm-hmm. was like, oh, you should do some photo shoots. I can introduce you to some photographers because this is when magazines were still a really big mm-hmm. thing, and they'll shoot solo of you even because mm-hmm. um, you don't even have to do a girl girl. And he starts rattling off names of. Uh, photographers he knows and he says this person that, that one I can't remember everybody he goes and then Suze Randall and I was like oh, you have no idea like but she won't shoot me and he was like why won't she shoot you that doesn't make any sense and I said I've been sending her Polaroids for like two years really? and they've never answered me and my I had a photo from a layout that Suze had shot taped in my locker at school my senior year of high school and it was a layout that Suze had shot of Janine, and she's dressed in riding clothes in a horse trailer. Oh, oh my God, I remember that day. And I, I actually assisted her that day on set, I remember. And since I ride, it was like a double, like, oh my God, this is the hottest chick I've ever seen, mm-hmm. doing my thing with mm-hmm. the most amazing photographer. And I used to buy magazines based on if they had a Suze layout, not based on who the girl was. Wow. I was totally stalking your mother. Wow. And so he was like, I know Suze really well. Do you want to meet her? And I was like, oh my God. He's like, we can go today. I'll call her right now. I'll drive you up there. 
I'm like, to her house? <laughs> and he's like, yeah. And I remember he took me, and I was more scared about meeting Suze than anyone else I've ever met. Wow. And she instantly loved me and booked me on the spot to shoot me. And so for my very- Let pro- me guess. Did you bring up the fact that you rode horses like th- as one of the first things when you walked in the door? Yeah, because we drove past the horses. Yeah. That's like the fr- that's the best way to nail my mom. <laughs> it's just literally right off the bat, be like, I ride horses too. Then like it, she will love you. Like It's just like you're a shoe in Yeah, and then it really went one funny. step further. And she's like, oh, I do eventing. And I was like, oh my gosh, me too. Like we even ride the same discipline. Yeah. Which Yeah, because there's a difference between hunter jumper and eventers and a or lot of racing or yeah, western like And that. a lot of people aren't eventers. Right. It's not that common. It's not that common because we're at a special breed of crazy. Yeah. And so we hit it <laughs> off right away and she booked me to shoot like the next week. Yeah. And I was so nervous and I'll never forget this. You're gonna be so upset with me. <laughs> so I got up to the shoot and I thought your mom was shooting me and you shot me. <laughs> I walk in and they're like, oh, Susan's, uh, Susan's daughter, Holly, is actually going to shoot you instead. Who, what shoot was that? We had the horse. I'm holding the horse and I think her horse, Kuba, is a baby. He's oh a Oh my God. I don't remember that shoot. How do I not remember that? We shot at day? the barn and there was a mare with a foal okay. in, in all the shots. I'm going to have to go And look. my hair was straight. I okay. strained it that day. Because the one that I remember, because I was actually looking back at old pictures of you because I was looking for something to print up to have you sign mm-hmm. for um, my patrons. And I came across the set that we did where you were in like that le- uh, leopard like uh, waist cincher corset yeah. thing. That was the first time she so- shot me at the studio. So she shot that. She, you were there, but I think she she shot that thought, one. Fuck, man, my fucking memory's gone because I totally thought I shot that, and I remember thinking at the time it was so great, and then I look back at it and now. I'm like, what did we do to her hair? Yes, and I was like, <laughs> I hate this. And yeah, I think I called Brad. And he was like, don't say anything. Yeah, I think I remember you hating it, and I thought it looked so great, and I'm looking at it now. I'm like, that looks terrible. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, you were right. <laughs> <laughs> Say it again. <laughs> you were right, Stormy. I'm sorry. So, um, actually, this brings up something. I brought you a present Uh-oh. that I don't know if you're going to want or not. Uh-oh. But if you don't want it, uh, we can um, give it to somebody else. But I. It's not a picture of me with that hair, is it? No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Do you remember <gasps> That's shoot? my favorite one. I know. I yes. love this too. So this has been hanging in our office forever, and then my mom, you know, they retired, oh, yeah. so they um, redid the office, and they rent out for Airbnb stuff, so she had to take all of her pictures down. So do you want it? Yes. She, I had her and sign the back of it. Because I just had lunch with her right before I came here. Oh my God, I love it. So there you go. That's Thank for you. you. Here, I'm going to pass it over here. That was one of my favorite, because you know what I loved about that one. That's mm. the first time that I met Emma. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, Emma is such an amazing makeup artist. I love that shoot. I see that um, that little caravan. Um, mm-hmm. It's from Omega Props in Hollywood. And sometimes when I go in there, that's like kind of on display right around the front counter. I'm always like, F-. I've always like wanted another reason to bring that back out. Yeah, because we shot your girl girl with Sophia Santi that day too, right? Yeah, and it was before she was Sophia Santi. Her yeah. name was Natalia Cruz. Yes, yes, and it was like a gypsy look. Yeah. And oh my god, that was so cool. But you did a solo set of me too, and that yeah. actually went to Hustler. Yes, yeah, the one of me by myself. Yeah, and then that, she came later, and we did a girl girl. Team. Yeah, no, that was really great, and we got like the smoke machine in behind, and fuck, man, those were the days. I wish I was as fat. I was, you know, I wish I, the first time I thought I was fat. Oh, you know what yeah. I mean? Like I wish I was like as fat as I was then. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Because <laughs> totally now, because I'm thing. looking at this, I'm like, oh my god, I was so hot I and think thin. The same thing. And now I'm so hungry. <laughs> <laughs> I think the same thing because I remember like thinking I was fat yeah. when I was 20 and I'm like, I wish it was as fat as I was, was back fat, then yeah. because fuck man, I don't know. Fucking. So, okay. So you now are with Digital Playground. I am. I'm contract director for Digital Playground and contract performer for Browsers. Okay. So you are performing again. Yes. Do, have you not performed for a little while or because uh, you, you were putting yourself in your own movies. I've written and directed all of my own movies for like the last 10 years. Right. Because I'm a control freak. Right. Or is it because if you want something done right, you do it yourself? A little bit of both. Or is it because I wanted to get paid double for the day? (laughs) The correct answer is D, all of the above. (laughs) Um, Anyway, uh, yes, I am. And uh, I'm only, at this point, only doing two scenes Mm -hmm. with the option to do more as many as I want. So they've been really cool about it. As a performer. As a performer. Right. And I did perform last year. Uh But like... um, 
you know, that's the other thing is people thought I retired or whatever. I definitely had slowed down. And part of that was because I'm, you know, getting older and I want mm-hmm. it to look as good, you know. So if it yeah. wasn't something that I really wanted to do, mm-hmm. I didn't do it. But mm-hmm. the main reason is because I was focusing so much on directing mm-hmm. because I was directing 10 full features a year for mm-hmm. Wicket, five for Wicket Pictures and five for the Passion series and writing all of those scripts and sometimes writing for the other directors. And the writing takes a lot out of you and it takes a long time. So it was just as a natural progression as I did less as a performer, I did more as a director, and right. I had the. I mean, of course, I'm not going to perform forever, so it was like a, just a natural progression. But it was right. never. I never was like I quit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and so I did a big movie last March called Unbridled. Yeah, I remember you had everybody come out to Texas. Yes. to shoot it. And then, so if I was going to do another movie as a performer, it would have been a couple months later. But I got bucked off my horse and broke. I sprained my pelvis, which is a really funny story. But I also fractured my back, so. I couldn't perform. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I fell in July and I was in a wheelchair for a little while and like directing on crutches. So I physically couldn't perform. And, you know, it wasn't ever like a on purpose thing. I remember when it happened actually because your two dads would okay. have constantly tell me how worried they were about you. Oh, yes. The yeah. dads. They bring it up all the time. They'd be like, Stormy's, like every time I saw them, be like, Stormy's doing better. Stormy this, Stormy that. Right. You're like their kid. It's so cute. Uh, but what's funny is he, um, Took off. It was a and it was a per, like you used to ride. So mm-hmm. like I had no idea that I was going to come off. Like mm-hmm. it was the perfect approach. The jumps weren't even high yet. We were still warming up. He got the perfect spot. Took off perfect. Everything went great. He landed and, and like in the air he spooked mm-hmm. and bucked. Um, bucked like sideways in like the what air. They do. Yeah. And so I knew I was coming off. Yeah. And they teach you let go. Yeah. Like you don't want to hang on and get yeah, dragged. Yeah. And it was a literally, it, he would have landed and it was a one stride to another jump. And mm-hmm. I was definitely going to come off and hit that other jump. So I abandoned ship. I yeah. let go. And I remember going, oh God, I'm going to fall. I haven't fallen in five years. Yeah. And I just let go. But as I let go and he hit the ground, he bucked a second time and he catapulted me. Oh and I went 15 feet in the air. And I went up so high, I remember looking around going, oh fuck, I'm really high. <laughs> and looking down and making eye contact with my trainer, who's like six foot something yeah. and I was still way over him and going oh fuck this is going to hurt way more than I thought and I hit the ground and it sounded like a gunshot it was this loud clap and he I mean I thought it was my back like it, mm-hmm. I landed kind of on my uh, left butt cheek slash hip area right. and I thought I broke you know and but I, mean, I didn't hit my head or anything and I couldn't stand up and my it was the scariest feeling because yes it really really hurt mm-hmm. but the scariest thing was my leg didn't work mm. like it didn't work yeah it wouldn't do like I couldn't stand up I couldn't oh whatever God, and so they're all so like terrifying. they're all like you broke your pelvis you broke like you definitely like I have two other friends that were there who had similar injuries and their mm-hmm. pelvises were broke because I could crawl I could do they were asking me questions and they're like oh yeah this that you definitely broke your pelvis they had to carry me went to the hospital you know had the the uh, X ray and the CAT scan and all this mm-hmm. stuff. And it took fucking forever that day. And I'm laying there and like, I couldn't even like spread my legs to like l- put one leg off the bed to go to mm-hmm. the bathroom. Like, my body wouldn't work and it was horrible. Oh my and so God. they finally come in and I was like, let me guess, my pelvis is broken. And even the nurse thought my pelvis was broken. And mm-hmm. the doctor comes in and he's got the little, the little bones, you know, the little mm-hmm. model yeah, yeah. of the pelvis and he's got, I'm like, oh yeah, it's definitely broken. So he comes in and he's like, well, we got your x-rays and I actually sent them out for a second opinion. I was like, oh my God, I'm going to have to have surgery. Like I'm crippled for mm-hmm. life and how am I going to feed my kids? How am I going <laughs> to feed my horses? Like <laughs> I'm going to, you know, all this stuff. And, yeah. and I was like, let me guess I broke my pelvis. And he goes, no, actually you didn't. And I was like, well, how is that possible? Like blah, blah, blah. And my friends had this injury and mm-hmm. he was like, do your friends have kids? And I was like, no. He goes, it's very hard if you've given birth to break your pelvis from a side impact, unless you're in like a car where you get crushed, from a side impact because of the hormone that lets your hips move when you give birth. It never fully leaves your body. Oh, okay. So he showed me the little diagram or whatever, and he said, so basically you sprained your pelvis. Okay. And that was the bones. And I was like, oh. My vagina slammed shut? (laughs) (laughs) And he was like, "Uh, yes. (laughs) And, you know, Glenn is sitting there. And and I just thought this was the funniest thing I've ever heard. So I start cracking up. He sees no amusement in this whatsoever. Right. Because I'm like, oh, my God, my vagina slammed shut. And the doctor doesn't know who I am. Like, he didn't recognize me or anything. And he's like, 
okay, what's wrong with her? She told me she didn't hit her head. And I'm like, you don't understand the irony of this. My vagina slammed shut. Like, and he was like, mm, yeah, mom. <laughs> <laughs> he's like, so I'll get you what you need and give you a prescription or whatever and walk out. And as soon as he's out, you know, my husband's like, really? <laughs> really? And I'm like, you don't think it's funny? He's like, Not at all. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> but yeah, like, so my pelvis, and it was, it took the longest time to heal because the ligaments were mm. torn in like your. Would it have been a shorter time to heal if, if you'd it broken broke, it? Yes. Oh, really? Yeah, I've heard like sprains can be worse than breaks. Yeah. I felt like someone punched me in the pussy. Oh my god! It was awful to the point where when they told me I had a, I did have a small compression fracture up pretty high, like mm-hmm. where my bra strap is. Mm-hmm. I didn't even, it didn't even hurt. He said it could take like two weeks for that to heal. Just don't twist, right? But the pelvis was pretty brutal. Wow. Yeah, That's- it just stopped clicking probably within the last month. Oh my god. Yeah. Ugh. But you know, it actually hurt less to ride than it did to walk for a while. So of course, I was back on the horse like three weeks later. <laughs> Because I'm crazy like your mom. <laughs> yes, yes. I think that's probably why you guys get along so well. Um, so, so you are. Are you performing in any of the movies that you'll be directing for digital, or are you only performing those two scenes for browsers? No, I'm doing one scene for browsers. Okay. Um, the, did the, you shoot that yesterday? No. Okay. Uh, actually, I didn't, but a lot of people think I did. Yeah. But uh, I shot promo pictures yesterday. Oh, okay. Because they st- they they wanted. To have pictures and right. for press releases because they haven't made the actual announcement yet. Yeah. So we did photos yesterday, but because it was on Kieran's set, mm-hmm. people were thinking, and you know, he's not correcting anyone. Of course not. So it's like whatever. But I, I am coming back in three weeks, and I am doing a scene with Kieran mm-hmm. for Brazzers, mm-hmm. uh, and then the second one I think is going to be for digital. And of course, they they just wanted to have something of me as a performer. Mm-hmm. Of course, and I yeah. want something current as well, so it's right. fine. But th- they're like, if you want to do more for your stuff, or you want to ri- do a, a write something for digital that f- is for you or around you, we would really like that. Yeah, but it's it's up to me, and so I'll just see. So how does your because so I've um, I've directed a couple of feature movies, and I've found that I don't know. I wish that my heart was more in it. I don't feel like I'm that, usually that committed to the material as I could be. So I've thought to myself that like I should really try to write something. But I just, I don't know. It's like I can't even start. I don't really? know like where to begin. I like don't know. I think I'm like intimidated to even take that first step. But I feel like if I wrote my own script, I would like, I would love shooting my movie more because it would be mine. You will love it and hate it. Yeah. Because the changes and the things that don't work out the way you'll that take you, personally you'll because, imagine, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It, so how does your process work? Like how do you come up with script ideas? Um I get and that's going to be the hardest thing about working for digital. Mm-hmm. Is the the movie that I'm directing the first couple days of April, they gave me the script. Mm. And I've never directed something that I didn't write. I've directed 100 and something movies and I've yeah. never not written the script. Yeah. That being said, I was pleasantly surprised that I really liked it. Mhm. Um, because I was pretty good. It's not going to be as good as whatever I'd write. I'm yeah, they probably gave writer. you their best writer. Um so it was good, and I made a couple of little tweaks um, that would base, were for production reasons. Mm-hmm. Um, but as far as like where I get inspiration, uh, all my friends know that they're not safe. Like if somebody has something really funny, really horrible, or like really embarrassing happen to them, they'll actually stop and go, "Oh fuck, I'm in a script now, aren't I?" I'm like, "Yes, you are." <laughs> and, uh, and then like sometimes I just get like. Song like a line in a song, I'll base a whole movie around it. Um, oh. There's a movie that I did called Bound, mm-hmm. and I got the whole idea from the script based off a line in an Eagle song where it says, every refuge has its price. And it's a story about this girl, and she marries this really rich older guy, but mm-hmm. then he gets sick, and she's like stuck with him mm-hmm. kind of thing. And the whole thing was just based on that one, like, wow, yeah, so I get it from all over. But yeah, no one is safe. <laughs> no one is safe. And my first several movies that I directed, mm-hmm. all the girls I killed were named after girls that were mean to me in high school. <laughs> it was very cathartic. That's hilarious. <laughs> How long does it take you to write a script normally? Like a day or two. Really? Yeah, because I have to sit down and get it all out. Okay. It's like a purge. If I stop and don't come back like within a, like only a couple hours, right. I lose it. I yeah. don't remember where I was going. Yeah. And I, I write, I handwrite everything first. Really? I have like a stack of notebooks. It's like ridiculous. I handwrite everything first. Uh-huh. And then, um, and it's weird to like look at it later and see how my handwriting changed from paragraph to paragraph. Mm-hmm. It's like, 
it's almost like I'm possessed and it just like pours out of me. And I'm more exhausted after writing a script than anything. Like I sit on the couch, on the corner of the couch, and I sit sideways and there's like an indention. And by the time I'm done, I smell terrible. (laughs) And there's like food wrappers and Starbucks cups and my (laughs) husband knows to just slide me food and back away (laughs) and just let me be and then I'll be done. Like some of the bigger ones took a little longer. Like want want it took a little bit longer. Um, And like Operation Desert Stormy and Tropical Stormy. Mm -hmm. But I think I did those in like three or four days. And they were like 80 pages. Well, I mean, writing I find is... I mean, this is another reason I haven't got back into writing because I used to write a lot. Is it? It is very like it's all consuming because when you're cre- like for me, the you know my day to day job, like it's a collaboration between me and the makeup artist and the model and the location. Like, there's all these different factors and all these different people coming together to help make a final product. But with writing, it's literally you and the paper. I like, like it. it's <laughs> all you. <laughs> yeah, and that and that is kind of intimidating. And I think that that's what like. Holds me back a little bit. I don't know. So you must be more of a people person than I am because I'm the opposite. Y- yeah, I guess I'm like so. Gollum with my like, laptop. <laughs> you know, like, my brad me. <laughs> I can do whatever I want, and you all have to do it. Like you know, like yeah. How was so? How did you get into that? Like, what was the first movie that you directed? And do okay, you so remember? This, I do because it's very funny. So I have always been a writer. Mm -hmm. Like in high school, I write funny little short stories that starred my friends. I wrote for the high school paper. I was editor of the paper. So I've always, creative writing was always my favorite class. Mm -hmm. Um, So I could write. Mm -hmm. When I got into the business and I got signed with Wicket, I was dating Brad Armstrong. And he's a fantastic writer. Mm -hmm. But I don't know if he enjoys it very much. (laughs) And I just remember like, he was on the bed and he's working and like, was frustrated and I guess maybe he had writer's block or whatever. And I said, I can write you a script. And he laughed at me. And that was his first mistake because he was like, oh, yeah, whatever. Looking back, I understand why because now I've gotten like so many of the most horrible scripts in the mail from people who said they could write scripts. Oh, I'm sure. So I shouldn't have taken it personally, but in the moment I was super fucking offended. Yeah. So I, <laughs> I took my laptop and I went in the other room and I wrote a script and I gave it to him and he loved it. And was like, I'll buy it from you. And I was like, you're going to give me money? Cool. And he bought the script for me. And mm-hmm. then he was kind of like, can you do it again? <laughs> you know? <laughs> and so I wrote a lot of his scripts that year. Right. And they like immediately added writing to my contract. Because mm-hmm. a couple of uh, directors from other companies came at me and was like, I heard you wrote this. Can you write for me? And Wicked mm-hmm. was like, Mm-mm. Yeah. So they added writing. And I don't know if there's ever been another contract writer. Before. Yeah, I don't know. So I was a perf- I was an act, a contract star and then a contract writer, mm-hmm. and that went on for like six or seven months. And I was I wrote many scripts for Michael Raven, Brad Armstrong, Jonathan Morgan, but uh, a lot of them I wrote for myself. So I was the star, and I'd be on set, and they were all fantastic directors. Mm-hmm. They're all super talented. Uh, Michael Raven was always my favorite. Like he's got this incredible vision, mm-hmm. and but it doesn't matter how great that director is. When they take what you wrote, it's still going to be their interpretation of what you wrote. It's not right. It's not wrong. It's just different. Right. And it, I have a photographic memory. So when I'm writing my movies, they play in my head. Right. So it made me really upset. Yeah. I would be like, it became a running joke with the crew that I would like almost tantrum and be like, you're ruining my vision though. Like it was supposed to be from like this angle and then like whatever. So <laughs> one of them, I can't remember who it was. It might have been Jonathan actually. It was like, why don't you try directing if you blah, blah, blah. And I was like, hmm, maybe I will. And it had never occurred to me to right. be a director. It never entered my realm of possibilities. But back then, everyone was making a ton of money. Mm-hmm. There was no piracy. Wicked mm-hmm. had money to set on fire if they wanted to. Mm-hmm. And I just remember going into Steve, and I'd only been there for, I'd only been in the adult business for a year. Mm-hmm. And I walked in there and like basically bluffed my way into letting him, letting him, let him letting me shoot a movie. Right. I had no fucking idea what I was doing. But he said yes, somehow. And I didn't know what I was doing. I remember sitting there, and Jake Jacobs was my cameraman. He's mm-hmm. been my cameraman since my first shoot. He still works for me. Uh, I remember going, like, okay, I got everything set. We're sitting there, and, and the very first shot of the day, I was like, leaned over, and I was like, when do I say rolling in action? <laughs> and he's like, okay, now you say rolling. Okay, now you now call action. <laughs> now you say speeding. You know, it was really yeah. cute. But... I never thought I could direct because I am the kind of person that would not do public speaking. Right. I would take a zero on an oral book report. Wow. Instead of standing up in front of the class. Wow. Like if you asked anyone from my high school, could you imagine me being in charge and telling people what to do? They'd be like, 
no. Yeah. She'd write the scripts. That's not a surprise. Yeah. But that was, and I just remember the first day of that first shoot, halfway through the day, I'm standing at the top of this staircase, and I'm directing, like, um, a party scene. So we had a bunch of extras. Because, mm-hmm. you know, go big or go home. Like, right, right, right. Let's not make this easy. Yeah. And I was, they were, everyone's looking up at me, and they're like, which angle do you want to shoot this at? And um, will the light be in the shot here? And, like, you know... And I'm like, okay, on action, you count to 10 and walk to here. And then you're going to, like, so I'm directing. And Mm -hmm. I was like, I had this, like, epiphany. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people go through their whole life without having this moment where I was like, this is what I'm meant to do. And then I was, and then in the back of my mind, I was like, and I am the puppet master. (laughs) Like, (laughs) like it immediately went to my head. Yeah. And I was like, this is like being God. (laughs) You. Bend over. Oh my God, they did it. You know what I mean? Like, this is amazing. And it just, like, I was in love instantly. And mm-hmm. I went in to Steve, and he was like, you know, the owner of Wicked. He was like, well, how did it go? And I was like, oh my God, it was the best thing ever. And can I do another? He's like, whoa, 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 whoa. Let's see how this one turned out. Right. So I had to wait like three months because it has to go through editing and yeah. stuff. And I was under contract for directing within three months. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. That's so great. Yeah, I find, um, I think it's funny because I had a meeting right before I came to this podcast and um w- the one of the women in the meeting were asking me about like why there weren't women more women behind the camera in the adult industry. I'm like actually there's definitely like that's changing and mm-hmm. your name was the first one on the tip of my tongue. I'm like well Stormy Daniels has been directing for a long time and you've won multiple awards and I mean all of your movies have done really well so it's just a it's just really great to see that you can show that like you can go from being in front of the camera to behind the camera. And I think that in a way that also gives you an advantage that not everybody else has yes. because you know what it's like to be in front of the camera. I also know when you're lying. <laughs> like your excuse is not going to work on me. Yeah. You know what I mean? Are you pretty like tough on set, you think? Like Have you ever had Asa on your podcast? <laughs> I have actually, <laughs> and you know what? Though I did listen to a little bit of her podcast with you, and she was talking about all the tricks that you were playing on her. <laughs> you guys sound like you have so much fun on set. I'm always like, I feel like whenever I'm working, I'm just focused on the next thing, getting out of there as soon as possible because you know we're being charged by the hour. Right. And I like, and I was listening to you guys talk. I'm like, I never have fun on set. I don't come up with tricks to play on people. I'm bored. <laughs> She's really yeah. the only one I torture. So if you ask her if I'm mean, she'll tell you yes. But I'm not mean because I do a lot of Mm pre-production. Like I plan everything, and I also plan a backup. Like this is my plan A. This is my this is my vision. Mm -hmm. But if this doesn't work, then we'll try this and this. And I'm really good about like thinking on the fly Mm -hmm. if something goes wrong. Mm -hmm. Like, and I always like I said when I'm writing the script, it's playing in my head. Mm -hmm. So when I get there, I already know what camera angle I want. Right. Like no, we might have long hours, but none of it is wasted. Right. Like the crew have. I mean, there's a reason why I have the same crew for the last decade. I totally agree with you. I see so many people recycle through crew Mm -hmm. members, and same like. My main guy has been with me for over 10 years. Like yeah. it's because then they know you and they start yes. to anticipate what you want. Yep. And just the, the communication on set is like, and just things move way faster. Right. And I'm very committed to when I make my shoot schedules, I always try to shoot people out. Mm-hmm. Like I don't make people wait around. Like I spend a, that's the hardest part about my job is mm. to break down the script and make oh it. Oh my God. Like, and my shoot schedules, I'm going to brag, are really fucking awesome. Like, I get compliments all the time. Like, oh my God, like, you got all this done? Yeah. You shot 42 pages of dialogue and five sex scenes in two days and we're out on time and the movie looks good? Well, it's because I obsess before mm-hmm. I even get there. Yeah. So when I get there, I'm so, I've already, in my mind, I've already shot this movie 20 times. Let's just do right. this. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. And I've heard my crew, I, I mean, I would be nothing without them. So right. I never think of myself as being better than them or mm-hmm. above them. And I won't name other directors by name, but we all know who I'm talking about. Yeah. Like, I don't go have sushi or steak and buy the crew a pizza. Yeah. Like, we're in this together. Yes. And when we shoot on location, I don't stay at the Ritz while they stay at Motel 6. Right. Like, I also share a room. Yeah. Like, we're there together. We're in it together. I, like, I don't leave set. I'm the first one there and the last one out. Same. I'm in it you know, with them and they respect me and they will literally do anything for me. Yeah. It makes a huge difference. I agree with you because a bunch of like my two main assistants only, um, 
work in mainstream. They don't do any adult. They only work for me an adult. And the only reason they work for me is because they love working for me. Right. But like otherwise they would rather not work in porn. But I totally agree with you. The way that you treat your crew and the people who work for you is everything because they're the I mean, you know, we don't just like wave a magic wand and everything's fucking right. perfect. It's like it takes a lot of really talented people coming yeah. together to create a good product. I mean, sometimes I like to think that some one of my strengths isn't necessarily that I'm a great like photographer. I think it's more like I'm a better like producer. Like I know the right people to, to bring in to put it together because I can't do it by myself. Right. You know? I mean, I can't I can tell you like I am good at what I do and I plan the best I can and I obsess over it, but everyone makes mistakes. And I can, yes. my cameraman has caught a continuity thing before and totally saved my ass before. Yeah. You know what I mean? And my art directors are incredible. They don't work for anyone else, an adult anymore, except me, because mm-hmm. they don't need to. Yeah. But they're awesome. Like, I can't make anything. And yeah. Andy and Kylie are amazing. Yeah. They, you know what I mean? But, if I, you know, I always cut people loose early if I don't make people wait around. Yeah, same. You know? Like, because there's a lot of directors that will have everybody come no. at 8 a.m. when, like, people don't need to be there till, like, 6. And I'm right. always like, why do you do that? And, and a lot of them do because and they, they do. don't take the time to plan out the day yes. when they need someone. And that's really dumb. One, but it's disrespectful, first yes. of all. Like, why waste someone's time? They could have run some errands and gone grocery shopping. Yeah. And then they're more grateful when they show up. Yeah. Plus, if you have talent there too early, by the time you shoot them, they're burnt out. They're tired. Yeah, exactly. And I don't like a bunch of people just lounging around on set looking bored. Because it, it gives me anxiety. It makes me sleepy. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, breaking down the scripts is like the hardest thing. Because sure. when we when I would shoot the last couple of movies I shot for digital, I had a great assistant who was like, I don't know how she did it, but she was so good at it. And I'm terrible at it because I'll look at the script and it just all swims together. I'm like, I can't fucking. And she'll break it down so that like, yeah. you know, we don't have to do that many changes and, you know, we don't pe- bring people in for the least amount of time possible, have them spend the least amount of time on set. And right. It's a lot. But we don't even have a real job. Come on. It's just, <laughs> you know. I know, right? Oh, it makes you so mad. Oh, I bet. <laughs> Oh, wait, how hard? You direct porn? How hard is that? You just hold a camera and go one, two, three, fuck. <laughs> I'll kill you. I know. <laughs> I know. I know. And it's funny, too, because, you know, in, in porn, because of like lowered budgets and everything like that, we've been forced to take on many different jobs. Right. You know, I mean, like we do, like one person does multiple things. Yes. Whereas in mainstream, you have someone who's just a gaffer, someone who's just a cameraman, someone who's just a DP, someone who's just yeah. a director. You won't ever hear anybody on adult side go, I can't move that cable. Yeah, it's exactly. against my union rule. Yeah, I know, you right? Know I mean, like we all just get in there and we do it and we're a family and it's great. Yeah. You know, and I actually, when I left Wicket last month and was negotiating my deal, that was one, that was my hill to die on. Mm-hmm. Like I made them agree, I have it in writing that I could bring my crew. Yeah. That's, I think, the most important thing. Absolutely. What do you think is the best movie that you've made so uh, far? Wanted. Wanted. That was your favorite. You won yeah. a lot of awards for that, right? Yeah, and it took me eight years to get that movie made. Wow. I always wanted to shoot a Western. Like, I poured everything in it. It's also the most expensive movie I yeah, ever shot. Yeah, period pieces are so expensive. And it was, it almost killed all of us. Like, oh, my God. It was everything horrible that could happen on a set happened. Like, we had a camera literally explode. Um, my horse died, not on set. I remember. Not on set. I remember. Unrelated to the shoot. That was during the floods, right? Yes. Oh, God. I had a horse drown back home and I couldn't leave because, unlike a regular movie where I could go, oh, fuck this, we'll come back in a week and do a pickup. Yeah. Everything was rented because it was yeah. guns and period pieces and horse. Like, you couldn't. I had, I had a, one day that was a $20,000 location. Jesus. Like, you can't reschedule. No. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. it's not going to happen. Yeah. Um, Let's see. It was 115 degrees in the desert, and we're wearing period costumes. Oh my god! Um, let's see. There was a fire that burned <laughs> down a set. Um, Andy and Kylie, their truck went off of a ravine, and they almost died. Um, we had people get stitches. 17 people cried, which is my record on set. <laughs> um, was one of them you? The last one was me. I was totally cool. Until, it's not a good movie until you've cried. I, it's the only time I've ever cried on set, unless it was in the script. Right. Um, and I was totally fine until the very last day. The very last thing that we shot was like a ha- not even a half day. It was a quarter of a day. And if you've ever seen the movie, it's the galloping shots of me and Brendan Miller on the horses. Okay. And it's just me and him because we could actually really ride. Mm-hmm. And it's it, it's um it's the last shot in the movie. It's when we ride off together and mm-hmm. we did this big galloping shot. And it's the only crew there were Jake and Andre, and they're in the back of a truck, 
and we're driving and we went out into the desert and we actually like galloped and they drove along. Mm-hmm. We did these huge sweeping cool shots mm-hmm. and um, we wrapped and I finally called rap and I looked over at my cameraman, Jake, and he started crying. And when he started crying, I lost my Then you shit. lost it. I was like, why are you crying now? We're done. <laughs> and he's like, you're so amazing. And, and oh. I'm so proud of you. And I, that, that's, it was his happy tears that got oh, me. Oh, okay. Yeah, it was All his right. happy tears. It like totally did me in. But yeah. it was a, And your mom saved my ass because we had so many problems on the one day. Oh, yeah. You came and you filmed at the pool. Yeah, I because, remember that. Because speaking of my $20,000 a day location. Yeah. The first girl that morning no showed, and she was one of the main girls. The wardrobe was bought for her. Fuck you, Tiffany Tyler. And oh my God. she, some, and I talked to her at ten o'clock at night, and I needed her because the four main girls. I was one of them. Um, it was supposed to be me, Tiffany, Amber Rain, and Annika. Mm-hmm. And I taught Annika how to ride because she had like a feel for it and whatever, mm-hmm. and she had to ride the least. Mm-hmm. But the other three of us really had to be able to ride. Mm-hmm. And we all three own horses in real life. Mm-hmm. So it kind of had to be this girl. Right. And I talked to her at 10 o'clock at night, and she was supposed to be first up. And sometime between 10 a.m. and 5, I mean, 10 p.m. and 5 a.m., she found Jesus. What? She Yeah, I was like, are you fucking kidding she me? She found Jesus? Yep, she quit the business. And Not was, a bag of Coke? Maybe he was in the Coke. I don't, I don't know what happened. <laughs> I'm like, I feel like that makes a lot more sense. Like, who finds Jesus between 10 p.m. and 5 a.m.? I feel like you're much more likely to find a bag of Coke. Yeah, um, whatever. Or, like, whatever. She, like... We had to scramble, and no one's answering their phone at six o'clock in the morning. Of course not. Like, and I'm like, "Who rides? Who rides?" Like, Julie and, and I don't have a test, and this one and that one. And Allie Hayes was like, "I don't ride, but I'll do it. I'm not scared." And I knew she had the personality. To yeah. Do it. And she drove from Vegas that morning, and we spent two hours with me teaching her how to ride. Wow. So we were already late in their schedule. Right. And there's this big pond scene, and it was supposed to be a three way girl 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 scene. And right. when I scouted the location. I had waded out into the water mm-hmm. to see how deep it was. Is the bottom safe? Like, you know, mm-hmm. it was freezing when I checked it because I was there at the beginning of May. Mm-hmm. But it was like waist deep and they had these beautiful reeds with flowers. And I knew the sun was going to be setting and it was going to be this beautiful golden hour. We we're mm-hmm. going to fly the jib over the water. And it was my vision and it was gorgeous. Right. And so, and it was going to be perfect. And sure enough, we got there that day and it was beautiful. And press was there. Like it was packed with press. And I'd already had like a, I'm going to kill this Tiffany. Rah, rah, rah. Yeah. Like it had already like started off rough and I'm right. teaching Allie how to, I mean, it was just a shit show. And so it came time to do the girl, girl scene. And it's like, we got to go, we're going to lose it. It's going to be perfect and blah, blah, blah. And so they go out into the water and Annika and Allie are supposed to be washing each other. And I'm sitting on the bank and we're talking and then uh-huh. they like convince me to come in for the scene. And so as they're doing that, they're like, start squirming around. And I was like, what's going on? Long story short, <laughs> They were not there in May because the water was too cold. Oh, no. But come June, oh, no. the end of June when it's 100 degrees outside. Oh, no. Leeches? On their buttholes. Oh, my God. <laughs> they come out of the water oh, and they're like, I have oh, a leech my in my vagina. And I was like, <laughs> it was, what the fuck? It was horrible. Wait, on her butthole for real? Yeah, Annika had a leech on her butthole. Oh my god! And you know what? What? They were cool. <laughs> they didn't try to kill me. They were like, "Do we have to go back in the water?" And I'm like, "Is that an option?" And they were like, "We got you, girl. Whatever wow. you need." I was like, "Well, I'm not going in that water." Yeah. So no, we're not. We're going to figure something else out. But we also had to. We had another thing that also had to be shot there, and that yeah. was the Indian village with like the teepees and stuff. Right. Like you know, these props were. I couldn't come back. Right. So I was like, well, you'll pick up the girl, girl, I'll figure it out. Like, I didn't know what to do. We shot, you know, we went over and shot the rest of the stuff, which was, it all came out amazing and yeah. everything edited is beautiful. But I was like, where am I going to do this girl, girl scene? And now I'm horribly over budget. And I was like, Suze has a pool that we can probably cheat because we still have the ride up shots to yeah. the water there. And I'll just keep the shots tighter. And yeah. if you watch the movie, you can't tell. Yeah. And it was, it's a rustic looking pool. So yeah. And we dressed it out and kept the sights, you know, and shot it yeah. at the right time. And we came and your mom was like super cool because she doesn't normally let other productions shoot yeah. big budget features and sex and stuff. Yeah. There. But, I mean, you know, for you, like, for you of course, you. she would do it. And I was like, I need you to do this for me. And all said and done with all the disasters that happened and Jesus. everyone almost died. Guess what I made for that movie? What? 
like $600 because I put <laughs> so much of my own money in. <laughs> and I did three sex scenes, wrote it, and directed it. Oh, my so God. So you can imagine, like, I actually should have gotten a bunch, and I just yeah. kept putting my money back in. And was yeah. like, oh, for $1,200 more, we can have that, and it's going to yeah. be amazing. I just couldn't help myself. Yeah. I went a little crazy. But, I mean, it's the movie that you're the most proud of. Oh, for sure. And it won a bunch of awards yeah. and got a bunch of mainstream press and the music video from it and all that stuff. Yeah. So it was worth it. But, it's, I mean, that's what sometimes you got to do when you really care about your craft and yeah. your career. But I think that also, you know, explains why you've done so well is because you put so much of, like, your personal self into it. You yeah. know, as opposed to you just show up, direct something, take a paycheck and go home and you don't think about it. Right. So, I mean... Um, so, okay, so you've been in the industry for a while. What would be your advice that you would give to a new girl coming in the industry? Um, a couple of things. One, before you ever utter your name to anyone, trademark it and get all your social media mm. and your web, your domain names because someone will steal it and try to sell it back to you for a ridiculous amount of money because people suck. Yeah. Um, have a really good lawyer. Don't sign anything ever without having an attorney look at it. Mm-hmm. And don't be afraid to say no. And make sure this is what you really want to do because the person that you want to find out about it the least is going to be the one that finds out about it. <laughs> right. Yeah, I think that's all pretty solid. I mean, that seems to be like, I mean, pretty much every girl that I've talked to has been like, just expect like expect the worst because I've definitely talked to girls who've been like, oh no, my parents aren't going to find out. They don't like to watch <laughs> porn. I'm like, That's yes, adorable. they will because somebody else will see it and tell them. It'll like right. it'll get. I mean, especially with the internet now, yeah, it's everywhere. Exactly, you can't get away from it. And people suck, and they like to get other people in trouble. Yeah. <laughs> um, have you noticed? Uh, so, like, you have you gotten like a bigger social media following since this whole story broke? Oh, of course. Yeah. Yeah. I've noticed that you're. <laughs> Because I follow you on Twitter, I, and I notice you've kept quiet about a lot of things, which is understandable. But I've just noticed that like you have a lot of new fans. Yeah, the OnlyFans thing—that's like all I ever see on your timeline. I'm like, well, she's doing well. I think they think I'm saying stuff over there that I'm not, even though I'm not leading anyone to believe it. And I will, I will say, I haven't lied about anything. I haven't misled anyone. Like, there's a common misconception that I like leaked this, and it was like it wasn't me. And eventually, yeah. like, hopefully, I'll be able to tell my side just for. Not for any sort of gain other than I want to be able to defend myself. That's the yeah. worst part is at this moment I can't defend myself. That's got to be incredibly frustrating. It's incredibly frustrating, especially for someone like me yeah. who is, you know, has no problem usually defending yes. herself. Yes. You, know? you aren't someone to keep your mouth shut about stuff. No, my name is Stormy for a reason. <laughs> <laughs> um, how was the Jimmy Kimmel show? It was awesome. Yeah? Like that's the other thing that was really frustrating because a lot of people um, – I mean, yeah, I was put on the spot, but that's his job. Yeah. And were you kind of expect? you were probably expecting that. Yeah. And that he was, was going to try course, to get you to say something. Of course. That's his job. Yeah. And, and he, and I knew that before and, and nothing, like the puppets I knew about, because mm-hmm. we filmed the other thing earlier and they came to me and asked me if I was okay with it. And I thought mm-hmm. it was hilarious. Yeah. You know, so a lot of it I kind of knew. Mm-hmm. And we would, he would be talking to me and then we would like take a break or whatever. And he would be like, I'm so sorry, but you're doing awesome. Just keep being mean to me. Like, you know what I mean? Like, he was like, I can't believe I. I can't catch you. Like he was kind of impressed or whatever. But I will say this about him. Um, He asked me a couple of questions that obviously the live audience heard. Mm -hmm. But when we cut, he looked at me and was like, oh my gosh, I'm sorry. I forgot that you're not a mainstream celebrity. Mainstream celebrities love talking about their kids. And he had asked me a couple of questions Mm -hmm. that I wasn't really comfortable answering Mm -hmm. because it was like her name and stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he was like, do you want me to edit those out? And I said, can you? And he was like, done. He immediately called the producer. He was like, cut those questions. Oh, that's really sweet. Yeah. Because you find usually when you go and do mainstream press, they always try to find some angle and try to edit it in a way that makes you sound like you said things you didn't say. Right. I think because he's a dad and all the stuff with his son, like he... Was like I'll I'll take it out. It, it doesn't help his story at all anyway, and so mm-hmm. he was like I'm, I'll just take it out. Yeah, that's and he, really and nice. he did. It was really cool of him to do that. Yeah. And, um. What a so okay. So what's coming up now? Um. I know that you're you're directing this one movie for digital, right? Right. That you didn't write, so it's mm-hmm. gonna be your first script that you didn't write. But are you writing something for them right now? Um. Not right now. I've been so busy that 
And I'm just why nothing else has been going I on in your life. I don't know why you keep saying you're busy. I know I have nothing. What going are you on. busy well, doing? Well, you know I have to take my sad ass on this uh, <laughs> this pathetic strip club tour because you know I've never danced before. So, so I'm well, trying to learn how to dance. Well, I'm, I'll, I'm I'll, joking. I'll do, if anybody didn't hear the beginning, I'll do your laundry for you. Oh yeah, because I don't want you to have to take time, uh, you know, yeah. out of to do your those own strip laundry, club washing strip machines aren't so great. You know, they take a lot of quarters. <laughs> That's like my favorite thing ever. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Well, thank you so much for coming on, Stormy. I really appreciate me. it. Um, I know you're very busy. Busy, girl. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I appreciate you taking the time. Can you tell everyone where they can find you on social media and if you have a website yes. and anything else that you want to plug? Um, of course. Uh, my Twitter is Stormy Daniels. Mm-hmm. My Instagram is the Stormy Daniels. Uh, with that being said, I will not ask you for money or gift cards, and and I will not promise to meet you in a hotel room for one hundred and fifty dollars. <laughs> so don't take any money. Don't give anyone any money. It's not me because it's happened a couple times. Yeah. Um. And then if you want to see any of the movies we've talked about today, mm-hmm. WickedPictures dot com, obviously, and to see all my new stuff, it'll be on Digital Playground and Brazzers when they are released. Yeah, and then you actually. Where'd I put them? You brought me movies. Oh, can you hand me those, Ernie? So uh, Stormy brought some DVDs that she signed for my patrons. So we've Unbridled. Yes. This is the one that you shot in Texas. Yes. About horseback riding. That is so about awesome. About inventing. Yeah. Oh, my God. It's like the porno Sylvester. <laughs> uh, Dirty Deeds. Which is a really funny comedy. And Vendetta. Which has my one and only anal scene in it. <gasps> Ooh, maybe I have to keep this for myself. <laughs> <laughs> and anal not by a not by a leech. Right. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, Stormy. Thanks. And um for everybody else, you can find me at Holly Randall on Instagram and Twitter. And if you want to support this podcast, go to patreon.com slash Holly Randall Unfiltered. Um or you can go to the iTunes directory and Give me five stars. Give me a great review. I would really appreciate it. Thank you guys so much, and we'll see you next week. Bye.